Hey guys, we might be a little bit earlier here uh, than anticipated, so just bear with us. We're going to be going uh, live. Uh, well, we'll be starting the session in about 15 minutes. So for you early birds, uh, thank you for uh, logging on. Um, as I said, we'll be going live in about 15 minutes. I just was hoping to try and test this out in a new process. Um and I'm going to enter into the studio and see. If I can. Uh, I guess I can't use that camera. Do I? Not what I was looking to do. Again, so uh, we'll be kicking off in just a bit. So bear with us, if you don't mind. Let's. Uh... So for those of you who are online early, uh, we've got about another 10 minutes before we kick off. So if you want to uh, bounce and come back, feel free, of course, if you want to uh, type in any comments or questions you'd like to see covered. We do have quite a few people scheduled to uh, join us today. Uh, we've got over 75 people registered for this event. Um, and of course, in uh, true Andrew Wolf fashion, uh, I am uh, playing around with technology on the fly uh, to see if uh, uh, we'll be able to stream this out to multiple platforms instead of just Facebook as we normally do. Um, so thank you guys who are your early birds who are uh, jo joining us live. Let me see if I can uh, share my screen here. We're going to be talking about... Um, tax planning, as well as understanding things like RESPs, RDSPs, uh, FHSAs, RRSPs, TFSAs. And if that's not enough acronyms uh, for you, we'll also be uh, throwing in some information about investing in your corporation. Um, so it should be a really interesting session, I think, particularly with the new FHSA account uh, and the ability to invest in that. That should be really interesting. So again, thank you, you early birds who are uh, joining us now and like i said we'll be kicking off in about uh, another nine minutes or so Got another eight minutes or so we'll be kicking off. So for the those of you who are logging into the Zoom session, uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off here. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, we do ask that you use the chat, or sorry, the Q&A functionality over the chat. Uh, I will check the chat before we wrap today to see if there's any questions we have uh, missed. 
Um, but uh, we'll be definitely uh, focusing primarily on the Q&A. And if you do want to raise your hand um, and use your voice to ask a question, please do raise your hand and I will open up your mic so you can ask questions live. Um, if you are one of the few people who are joining us or one of the many people who are going to be joining us live on Facebook today um, or on any of the other platforms that we're using, uh, you can post your questions in the comments and uh, we will have one of my colleagues relay those over to us here live in the Zoom session and we'll do our best to answer your questions as we progress through the presentation. Again, we'll be kicking off in about seven minutes. Got about five minutes to go now. For those of you who are uh, joining us live, we will be kicking off in about five minutes. Again, we're going to have a really great session today uh, on understanding tax planning. Um, we're also going to be talking through uh, some key acronyms here about uh, where to invest those hard-earned savings, RESPs, RDSPs, FHSAs, RRSPs, TFSAs. And if you don't know what those acronyms are, don't fear, we'll be explaining those to you today as well and talking about the pros and cons of choosing one over the other. Uh, this is obviously a really timely session uh, because uh, many of you are doing your year-end tax planning, seeing and trying to decide how you're going to do any income splitting um, and uh, what you're going to do as far as uh, your salaries or dividends for the corporation. So we'll be, of course, covering the difference between a dividend versus a salary, which is a common question we get every year. Uh, so we'll make sure to cover that today as well. Again, a little bit of housekeeping um, for those who are here early uh, as participants in the live Zoom. 
We do ask that you use the Q&A to ask any questions that you might have. Uh, I will review the chat uh, before we close out the session at the end, uh, but I'll only be answering questions from the Q&A as we go through the session. Uh, for any of you who are watching live on our stream, you can post your questions in the comments and uh, we will relay those through to the live webinar uh, as well. If um, we do happen to miss one during the session, we'll come back and circle back to those questions uh, post-webinar. So again, thank you guys for joining us uh, and taking time out of your business, busy days today. And we'll be kicking off in just two more minutes. Just one minute to go, and then we'll be kicking off. Okay, it is time to go live. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Wall. I'm going to be your host again today as we're talking about some tax planning strategies, as well as things like understanding RESPs, RDSPs, FHSAs, RRSPs, tax-free savings accounts, or investing inside your corporation. So really, this goal, this session is about... Um, you know, how to optimize your tax planning for the year. Um, and if you've got money left over, where are you going to be saving that? So it's going to be a really interesting session. We've got over 75 people joining us live today in the Zoom session. Uh, and who knows how many will be joining us uh, live on all the various Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn lives we're doing right now. Um, so I'm your host, Andrew Wall, as I mentioned earlier. And I'm the managing partner here at CPA4IT. Um, our agenda today will be covering a little bit of who we are. Uh, we'll be going over what is tax planning, uh, discussing the difference between salary versus dividend, uh, the benefits of income splitting. And lastly, uh, we're going to hit where to save those hard-earned dollars that you have, whether that's in your RRSP, your tax-free savings account, your RESP, your RDSP, your corp, unregistered, or the new first-time home savings account. So again, a really interesting topic. We will be reiterating some of this stuff again in the new year, but we really wanted to make sure we hit this because with the new FHSA, which came out uh, this year, um, became live on April of 2023, uh, there are some things that we want to make sure that you're aware of, um, and you may really want to make sure you get that uh, account opened up before the close of the calendar year. Um, so as I said, my name is Andrew Wall. I'm the managing partner here at uh, CPA4IT. Um, we're an accounting firm that's been specializing in service-based professionals, um, primarily in the IT sector, but also helping doctors and realtors. And we've been doing that since my father founded the original firm back in 1984, uh, I've taken over the firm, uh, brought it into the modern world of technology. And for those of you who are interested, we also do a podcast every uh, Friday about artificial intelligence uh, and its effect on business. Um, so we've got a really great speaker this week, Jim Harris, who's 
a world-renowned author and speaker who speaks about disruption and innovation. And I think it's going to be a really amazing session. Uh, but at CPA 4IT, our mission here is to help our clients organize their finances, create wealth, and transform wealth into a legacy. And that's really the purpose of what our session is today, uh, about helping you to uh, create wealth by maximizing tax strategies um, and minimizing tax. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, a little information about why people tend to choose to work with us is we do offer a free initial consultation. Um, we also have a turnkey solution with in-house paralegals. So we can help you from cradle to grave, from creating that corporation at the beginning, uh, to the bookkeeping, to the accounting, uh, to the dissolution of your corporation if you get to that point. Uh, we also offer some proprietary tools which are unique, like our benchmarking analysis, which helps you see how you compare to the average and the median and identify opportunities where you might be below the average uh, and risks where you might be above average and at risk of being uh, potentially audited. Uh, on that note, we also offer audit representation protection that if you are audited, will represent you up until the third and final stages of appeals at no additional cost to you. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about us. And now I want to, um, you know, jump into exactly what tax planning is. Um, and it's the analysis of a financial situation or plan from a tax perspective. And the purpose of a tax planning is to ensure tax efficiency and reduction of a tax liability and maximizing the ability to contribute to retirement plans are sort of crucial for success of an effective tax plan. Bottom line here is we're trying to figure out how much money we're going to be taking out of our corporation, how much of that is going as salary, how much of that is uh, is going to dividends. Are we doing any income splitting? Uh, if you've got money left over, where do we want to keep that? Do we want to keep that inside your corporation? Do we want to leverage uh, registered plans like RRSPs and RDSPs uh, and first-time home savings plans, home savings accounts, and all these amazing tools? And today we're going to talk through a little bit about what the difference of those programs are and why you might choose one over the other, because obviously the answer that we give to all of our clients when they ask us about tax planning is it depends on your unique situation. Um, and so here we're going to try and cover all of the basis so that you can look at your unique situation, sit down with your account manager and make a plan uh, for your corporation and yourself to minimize tax and maximize wealth. So when it comes to tax planning, we tend to look at tax brackets as a guiding principle for determining um, what kind of salaries we want to do and how we want to do the tax planning, uh, the tax planning for you. Um, so right now, what we're looking at here is the personal tax rates here in Ontario, which is combined federal and provincial tax rates. Um, and you can see that there's different tax rates, whether it's other income, capital gains, uh, or dividends, and again, different whether it's eligible or uh, ineligible. Um, but I think the most important thing to note here is that when you get above $247,000, you're paying 53.53% personally. Um, and even in the lowest tax bracket, um, of uh, the first 51446 you can see you're paying 20.05%, which is higher than the small business tax rate of only 12.2%. Um, so you can see that the goal a lot of times with our clients is to keep as much money inside your corporation as possible, but we are limited by the guardrails of what actually took place. So one of the big things when it comes to tax planning is doing your best to leave as much money inside your corporation as possible so that your accountants have as many options available to them as possible. Because fundamentally, if you've taken money out of your corporation, we're going to have to allocate that as either a salary or a dividend. Uh, you know, there's usually a trick or two up our sleeve as accountants, uh, but to keep it simple, if you've taken money out of your corporation, we're probably going to have to declare it as either a salary or a dividend. Um, and you can see here the uh, the tax rates can get quite steep uh, at over 53% uh, at the highest tax bracket on um, employment income. Uh, now, even on a dividend, you're looking at 47.74%. Um, uh, on an ineligible dividend and 39.34% on an eligible dividend. We'll, we'll try and cover what the difference is between those two as we go through the, 
benefits of salary over dividend and why you might choose one over the other. Um, but this becomes our guiding principle. And usually when we're looking at tax planning strategies, our goal here is to keep you below the uh, certain tax thresholds. Um, and, you know, here we've got the combined rates, but a lot of times we'll focus in on the federal rates because those are the larger of the uh, two taxes, federal versus provincial. And again, depending upon your province, you might have a completely different rate structure. So this is just given to give you an outline of, you know, why and how we end up trying to focus on specific numbers is because as your income goes up, your tax threshold goes up, but it's only on the income above that. And that's because we have a marginal tax structure. Now, the ways you can optimize your tax planning um, are through the use of dividends where and when applicable. Um, if your corporation is in a retirement phase and you're only generating investment income, um, oftentimes dividends is the best strategy. However, usually during your income earning years, like when your corporation is generating income, we typically recommend a salary over uh, a dividend. And, and we'll explain that more as we go through salary versus dividend. Um, but when it comes to, to salary, um, we've got a lot more options available to us, um, especially with the new TOSI rules or tax on split income, which really limit how we can do income splitting through the use of dividends. Prior to TOSI, uh, you know, dividends were a very effective strategy. You didn't have to justify any involvement in the business. Unfortunately, now with the new TOSI rules, you do um, have to look at how actively involved people are in the business. Um, and uh, if they're not actively involved in the business, there's effectively a punitive tax that makes dividend income splitting not very effective. Um, but with um, salary income splitting, which is still a viable option, um, the only caveat that it is subject to a reasonableness test, um, there are some significant advantages including the ability to have salary declared anytime throughout your fiscal year end, um, which uh, as many people know, can be any month throughout the year. And if your fiscal year end happens to fall after July 31st, you've also got an added benefit of uh, effectively a third year of tax planning, because let's say your year end is July 31st of 2023. We could de declare income, um, from August 1st to December 31st, 2022, we could also declare income uh, from January uh, all the way through to uh, July 31st of 2023. Um, and then we can actually even do a bonus up to 180 days from your year end, which would actually push you into the first months or, or the, uh, the first month of the 2024 calendar year. So effectively, you've now got three years that you can use for income smoothing and income splitting. And as we saw earlier, because of the marginal tax system, whenever we can smooth taxes over more people or over more time, as opposed to having peaks and valleys, we'll pay less tax overall. So smoothing income and income splitting are really effective strategies for optimizing your tax planning. And then of course, as I said earlier, leveraging that small business deduction and paying only 12.2% in your corporation is a very, very effective tool. Um, and of course we are limited by your actual ability to leave the money inside the corporation. Uh, now we do have some strategies uh, and we do a whole separate webinar on tax-free loans and understanding the difference between a home loan an auto loan and a shareholder loan. Um, and I encourage you to come and check out those. Those won't be covered today, but those are another strategy that we can use to optimize your tax planning. If you're uh, considering setting up a home loan, an auto loan, or shareholder loan, uh, these are sort of advanced tax strategies. And I wouldn't recommend you do these without a discussion with your accountant, because the documentation on these loans is crucial uh, for you being able to maintain those loans and them not being deemed to be uh, director's advance or salary. Now let's have a quick discussion of uh, salary versus uh, dividends, because this is a, a big question that we get over and over again. Um, and first of all, um, as I said earlier, we do have new tax on split income rules uh, or TOSI uh, that do really limit our ability to do dividends. Uh, to people who aren't actively involved in the business. Now, if you are over 65 years of age, you can 
do some income splitting with your spouse. Um, but if your children aren't actively working in the business for more than 20 hours a week, uh, it's really difficult to do income splitting through the use of dividends. Um, however, um, dividends can have some benefits because you've got a little bit greater uh, flexibility. There is um, no requirement uh, other than the TOSI rules for number of hours worked in the business uh, to justify how much sa- how much dividend that you can give to uh, shareholders. Um, there is also some benefits from a cash flow perspective. And what we mean by that is that with a salary, in addition to paying taxes, uh, which you will pay uh, in both dividends and salary, uh, you're also paying into CPP, um, which is an outflow of cash. It's not a tax. Uh, it is a pension. Um, and we will show you with some income splitting that there's actually some benefit to CPP. And we personally believe that CPP and RRSPs are very effective strategies that should be leveraged, which is why we tend to favor salary over dividend in your income earning years. Now, of course, if you don't value CPP and you don't value RRSP, you might improve, you might prefer the better cash flow that goes along with dividends because in addition to not paying into your CPP, you won't pay the tax on your personal portion of uh, the dividend income until you file your tax returns in April. Whereas with salary, um, you know, there are, deadlines that are related to your average monthly withholding amount and your um th- your th- your employer threshold with it with regards to employer tax uh, it gets a little bit more complicated and again we have a whole session dedicated uh to CPP we uh, or and payroll tax which we just did um and so if you're thinking and trying to figure out what should you do as far as payroll and salary for yourself and your family members, I encourage you to go back and watch that pre-recorded session that's available on our YouTube channel, as well as our Facebook page to get more information on that. But you will be paying taxes on the salary portion earlier with a salary uh, versus a dividend. And I should say not salary portion on the personal tax portion. The other thing about a dividend that's important to note is with a dividend, you actually have two taxes you're paying, whereas with a salary, you only have one. So a salary is a deductible expense to the corporation. And because it's a deductible expense to the corporation, the corporation is not paying any tax on any salary it pays to employees. Now, because of that, the employee pays the full personal tax rate. And that's why you saw on that tax schedule earlier that the taxes on dividends are lower than the taxes on salary. Now, one of the big misconceptions is that the total tax is less on dividends because you can see when you go to that tax, when you go to that uh, schedule that shows you the tax rates, it looks like it's less. But what you have to keep in mind is that dividends come out of retained earnings inside of a corporation and retained earnings are money that have already been taxed, earnings of the corporation that have already been taxed. So you've paid a corporate tax on those dividends, which is why you're paying less personally. And there's something called the theory of integration, which is intended that when you integrate the two taxes, the corporate and the personal, that there should be no benefit of choosing salary over dividend from a simply tax perspective. And we've had lots of our clients over the years do lots of different calculations to find out that really the only difference is pennies or dollars and nothing material in choosing one strategy over the other. Now, there are exceptions to that in situations where your comfort, your company um, you know, doesn't have the income to support the salary and where a dividend might make more sense. But again, that's unique to your individual situation and your accountants would bring that up with you. Um, so those are the fundamental differences between a dividend versus salary. And as we said earlier, we would generally recommend a salary over a dividend in your income earning years. Now, when it comes to income splitting, we are big fans of income splitting as long as we can justify it. Um, and, you know, we do have to be aware of these tax on split income rules um, when it comes to dividends and using dividends as an income splitting strategy. There are some situations and some exemptions to TOSI in which we can still do uh, income splitting through dividends. Uh, but more commonly now is income splitting through the use of salary. But 
salary is subject to a reasonableness test. You can't pay your 14 year old $100,000 a year to do your filing. Um, that's not reasonable. Uh, and you're likely to run into some problems with CRA if you do that. Um, however, there are lots of ways to justify reasonable income splitting with family members. Your spouse is typically your financial partner, your consultant. And, you know, I was having a discussion with another financial planner um, last week and talking about this. And, you know, they had always positioned it as their, you know, spouse or partner was, you know, the secretary in the business. And, you know, we could justify a salary of about $25 an hour. And we like to take a different perspective and look at the role as a higher level role. They're not the secretary, no, they're not the lowest level admin in your corporation. They're the highest level business consultant. We're providing advice and coaching and counseling to your business, um, which allows us to justify more reasonable and higher salaries to them. And again, when it comes to children, we love leveraging things like social media and web, which can justify high salaries um, for uh, lower hour or lower hours of, of deliverable work. Um, and kids tend to do really well with technology, often better than their parents. So it's really great ways to justify uh, income splitting there. But to give you some examples of how substantial the benefits can be when it comes to income splitting, as we look at income splitting in one very simple example, where you've got one individual making $100,000 um, and paying about $29,000 in both income tax and the employee and employer portion of CPP um, and taking home about $70,000 of that. Uh, whereas if we split that amongst two individuals who are at $50,000, um, they're netting $74,000. So uh, more than a $4,000 benefit um, in reduced taxes by splitting that salary between two individuals. And that doesn't even take into account the benefit of the CPP, which as we said earlier is a pension. And the more you pay into your pension, the more that you get out of it in retirement. And you're basically getting double the benefit of CPP in this situation, even though you're paying less overall tax including your CPP. So in this situation, even though the total tax is 25,000 of 25,000, uh, you've got, uh, you know, over $10,000 of that just in CPP. So you've only got, you know, $14,415 or so in actual tax, and you've got over $10,000 in CPP compared to um, the alternative where, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, about $7,500 worth of uh, 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 CPP. So you've got another $2,500 in additional CPP benefit over the $4,000 um, uh, income splitting strategy where you're only taking it as one individual. And again, you can apply that same strategy to splitting over multiple years. It's the same principle. The fundamental difference is that there would be slightly different tax rates from one year to another. Now, interesting thing to note as far as tax planning of 2023 versus 2022 is that the tax rates didn't change. What changed was the thresholds um, as far as um, uh, what where the tax brackets break. Um, and it was interesting as I, I redid this session for today and redid these numbers um, that the tax savings actually slightly decreased um, with 23 versus 2022. And so effectively what that's telling us is that um, the new tax brackets are actually favoring higher income earning um, individuals rather than lower income in earning individuals. Um, and so it's really interesting uh, to, to see that, um, especially when you think of the liberals being in power and them saying that they're trying to help the small guy and the tax is just not showing that. Um, but again, I could I could be on my pedestal there for uh, talking tax and politics for way too long, and I'll try to avoid politics where I can. Um, so again, where do you want to save um, uh, that hard earned money? So if you if you have uh, money left over at the end of the day, um, do you want to save that inside your corporation? Do you want to save that inside RSPs? Where do you want to save that money? And we want to talk to you a little bit about the different um, tools that you can use to save money um, because these will affect your tax planning. 
Um, because if you're going to take money out and put it into an RRSP, we're going to probably give you a higher salary that's offset by that RRSP, um, resulting in a lower net income to you and a lower net income to the corporation um, and some additional tax deferral. Um, but is that the right strategy? And again, unfortunately, as always, depends on your personal situation. Um, so uh, again, I do want to remind people, if you do have any questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A. Um, but now I'm going to just take a chance to jump right in to understanding these. Um, and I've got them. They're not necessarily in any particular order, uh, although some of these ones I'm going to start with first are are ones that are uh, what I would say are the most important if you have the ability to contribute to them. So an RESP or registered education savings plan um, does not reduce your taxable income. Um, so if you uh, want to contribute to your RSP and you've got a corporation, you're going to have to take the money out of your corporation, pay personal tax on it before contributing to your RESP. But if you have children, this is something you absolutely, in my opinion, must be doing. Um, and that is because the RESP, while it doesn't reduce your income, it is eligible for a grant. So a grant is free money from the government. Um, and that grant's called the CESG. Um, and the CESG is going to be based off of your contributions. Uh, typically, you can do a maximum contribution per year of 2500 for each year. Um, your child, <coughs> pardon me, your child is re registered um, for the RESP and the Canadian Education Savings Grant. Um, and you will get $500 uh, in free money from the government for every $2,500 that you contribute into your um, RESP. In addition, when the funds come out of this RESP, um, they are taxable, but they are taxable to your children. Um, and they are taxable at a time when they often have other um, tax credits available to reduce their taxable income because they're going to school, right? This is a, this is an education savings grant designed to help you save um, for the rising costs of schooling. Uh, I would have loved to see this, you know, grow and, and be improved. Uh, but right now, the maximum that you can get for the CESG is $7,200. And it's important to note that you can't you know, when they're 18, go back in and contribute the maximum and get the whole CESG because there are maximums that you can contribute each year. Typically, I say it's a maximum of $500 in grant money, but actually you can get up to $1,000 because it'll allow you to catch up for last year. Uh, but you're not going to get more than $1,000 in grant money per year. So if you have children um, and you haven't started saving for their uh, C for their CESG and their RESP. This is a tool that absolutely every parent should be taking advantage of um, and getting that free grant money and watching that money grow. Because when we talk about investing, uh, the longer time that that money is invested, it's going to grow and compound even more. And you'll have more money available to invest in your children's education, which, as I said, is getting more and more expensive. I also want to talk about the RDSP. Um, so this is the Registered Disability Savings Plan. Um, again, it does not reduce your taxable income. Um, and in order to be eligible for the RDSP, you must be approved for the disability tax credit. You have to go through some hoops with your doctors uh, to get eligible. Uh, but uh, for this, um, you uh, can do contributions up until the year you turn 59. Um, and again, it's going to be eligible for a grant. So this is free money again. Um, and that grant is between $1,000 to $3,500 with a maximum of $70,000. So much larger uh, grant available uh, than the education savings plan. Um, and you'd be surprised at what things do qualify for a disability tax credit and the um uh, the D RDSP. So if you're unsure about this, I encourage you to speak with your family doctor um, and see if you, any of your underlying conditions might be eligible to qualify for the disability tax credit. Because again, this is free money to leverage. Um, now the RRSPs are a tool which are going to begin to reduce your taxable income. 
Um, and these are uh, obviously most people are familiar with RSPs. They've been around for a, a long time. Um, the biggest thing with the RSPs is to not over contribute because there are penalties for over contribution. Uh, how much you contribute again is going to be tied to your specific situation. Um, your unused RSP contribution room does carry forward. Um, and that's, uh, and it looks like I haven't updated this since 2021. So I apologize. I got two years to, uh, re-update this. Um, so it is, um, higher than 27,830 right now. I don't know what the number is off the top of my head. Uh, maybe Rachel can, uh, get that and post it in the chat for us. Uh, but it is 18% of your pre-tax income, uh, for the fiscal year, plus whatever room that you had carried forward. And the advantage of an RSP is it is a tax deferral strategy. Um, it allows you to reduce your taxable income today, and then you pay tax when you pull money out of your RSPs. The most important thing that I think is important to clarify when it comes to RSPs is how the income is taxed. So inside of an RSP, you don't have anything like a capital gain or dividend income or interest income. It's just you know, the balance of your assets in your RSP. And when you withdraw, you pay tax at your marginal tax rate on whatever money that you withdraw. And where that can become a negative is with capital gains. Because if you have capital gains inside of a corporation or inside of an unregistered investment, many of you may be familiar that you actually only pay tax on half the gain. Um, and that can be a significant tax difference. So while you are getting the tax deferral, you might actually pay more tax than if you were to leave the money inside your corporation um, and use a uh, different vehicle. Um, and again, an IPP, which we don't really cover here, is going to be so similar in that you'll pay tax on whatever you withdraw. Um, and now those capital gains, uh, be the benefits of a capital gain will be sort of lost. So typically what we recommend for our clients is a combination of leveraging RSP, which is a great deferral strategy. Um, and there are benefits to RSP, but mixing up your portfolio so that you've got different investments in different places and you're leveraging the benefits of these different um, savings vehicles. But again, I won't belabor RSPs because I think most people are familiar with them. Uh, what I will spend a little bit more time on is the first time home savings account, because this is uh, this is new this year. Um, so uh, it came into effect April 1st, 2023. Um, you can contribute up to a maximum of forty thousand dollars over the lifetime and up to eight thousand dollars in any one year. Again, think back to the RESP where you do need to put in a certain amount each year. Again, the balance from the previous year will carry forward, so you can contribute up to a maximum of sixteen thousand dollars per year. But if you are thinking of buying a house, it is really important that you create your FHSA account with your bank um, before December thirty first, and you make your contribution as early as possible so that you can hopefully get to that maximum of $40,000 as soon as possible. Um, so the beautiful thing of the FHSA is like um, TFSA's uh, RSPs, um, uh, the tax uh, on, um, sorry, I apologize. So I'm reading a line here, which is confusing me. So like an RSP, it's going to reduce your taxable income when you make the contribution, which is a big win. Like a tax-free savings account, which we haven't covered yet, when you pull the money out, it's tax-free as long as it's for the purchase of a home. And, you know, there are, are some caveats that if you were to pass away uh, and it goes to an estate that it is going to become taxable, or if you don't use it for a home, it will become taxable. But if you do use it for a home, uh, it comes out tax-free. So you're basically getting the benefits of uh, both a tax-free savings account and an RSP contribution. It's reducing your taxable income, um, plus it's not taxable when you take it out. So this, to me, if you are a first-time home buyer, is, again, one of those no-brainer that you should absolutely um, be taking advantage of. But again, like both TFSAs and RSPs, uh, there are um, tax implications on over-contributions, uh, which would apply and and be punitive. So you don't want to over contribute. Uh, so you want to make sure you're keeping track of how much room that you have left 
how much that you've contributed. Obviously, right now for the first year, it's really simple. You know, uh, if you're over 18, which you do have to be in order to be eligible for the first time home savings account, you can go to your bank, you can create an account, you can contribute $8,000, uh, and that's going to reduce your taxable income this year. So if you are a first time home buyer, uh, this is absolutely a no brainer for where you should be saving money inside your uh, total portfolio. Now, the tax free savings account. Um, is um, different from the RSP and the uh, first time home savings account in that it does not reduce your taxable income. Uh, so any money that you want to contribute to your TFSA, again, you're going to have to take that out of your corporation, pay personal tax on it before contributing into your TFSA. So you do want to take that into account. Um, and again, I forgot to update this, but I did update it last year. Um, so right now, if you're contributing in 2022, if you were contributing in 2022, uh, your eligible deposit amount would have been 81,500. There would be another, I think it's 5,000 and something. Um, so you're over 86,000 uh, this year, as long as you were 18 or over after the year 2020, 2009. Now, again, if you want to figure out how much room that you have in RSP, how much room you have in a FHSA, how much room you have in TFSA, your CRA uh, your my CRA account, not your my business CRA account, uh, will tell you all of this information. So you can log in. And again, because there are penalties for over contributions on all of these things, I strongly encourage you to log into your CRA before making any decisions on how much you're going to be contributing before the close of the fiscal year um, or the calendar year, as well as before the deadline for RSPs, which will be, um, you know, the end of February as always, and I guess I didn't cover that in RSPs is the deadline again. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. There's lots of stuff that goes out to remind you that that deadline. Um, but with the TFSA, the big advantage you're getting here is that any growth that you have in the TFSA is completely tax-free. So any money you put in because you paid tax on it, you can take out without any tax implications, including the growth. The other thing that's great about the tax-free savings account is that if you take money out of the tax-free savings account, you can wait a year and in the next calendar year, you can put that money back in um, and you get all that room back. Unfortunately, with an RSP, if you do take money out of your RSP early, uh, you will pay tax on it and you don't get that room back. So you don't, you don't wait another year and then you can put that money back into your uh, RSP. So the RSP should be a sort of a long-term savings plan, whereas your tax-free savings account should be your emergency reserve, right? Uh, if anything were to happen, this is the first place that you're going to pull from because you can pull money out of here tax-free. Um, and if it was an anomaly and you build the money back up, you can contribute the money back in and not lose any of the benefits of the tax-free savings account. Um, so those are the big advantages there. Um, and then, of course, we have investing inside your corporation. Um, now, investing inside your corporation um, really has some benefits for you. But the important thing to note is that it is not taxed at that great 12.2% tax rate we talked about earlier. If you are investing inside your corporation, there are a couple of different types of investment income that you could generate, and none of it is eligible unfortunately, for this small business rate of, uh, you know, 12.2% uh, 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 here in Ontario. Um, so what we have to look at is uh, whether it's interest income, dividend income, or capital gains. If it's dividend income, it goes into a special account. You will pay tax on it, and you will pay tax at a higher rate. Uh, at the general rate, which is, um, you know, usually around 38%. Um, and it gets a little bit complicated because um, it depends on what type of dividend, whether it's eligible or ineligible. And also uh, there's some federal tax abatements, some more complicated things, but it's going to be, you know, uh, up at that higher amount, uh, but it goes into a special account and it goes into a refundable uh, tax account, either an RDTOH or an ERDTOH. So that's a re recoverable dividend tax on hand or an eligible recoverable dividend tax on hand. 
And when it goes into these uh, special pools, it means that you can get that tax back if you issue a dividend from your corporation. So if you're investing inside your corporation um, and you're not paying yourself any dividends now, that will build up. And then once you hit retirement and you start tilling your money out of your corporation in the form of a dividend, you'll get back those taxes inside your corporation as a refundable dividend, uh, as a refundable tax. Now, if you have um, interest income, again, that's going to be taxed at the higher rate. Nothing special going on there. You're just taxed on the dividend, on the interest income. Uh, so if you've got a GIC or something like that, and that's probably the least favorable tax inside of a corporation and more apt for something like an RRSP. Whereas a capital gain inside of a corporation is uh, truly a special thing um, because as I said earlier, you're only going to pay tax on half of the capital gain. So let's say that you purchase uh, a stock for $100,000. Uh, it increases in value to $150,000. You then sell it. Um, so you have your uh, cost base, which is the $100,000. You have your proceeds of disposition, which is $150,000. Your capital gain is then $50,000, the difference between the two, but you only pay tax on $25,000. In addition, the portion of the tax that is tax-free, the $25,000 that's free to you, um, goes into a special account called a capital dividend account. And this can flow all the way down to the shareholders completely tax-free. Now, there are some special hoops you got to jump through with a capital dividend confirmation and a capital dividend election, uh, but those capital gains can come out to its shareholders completely tax-free. And this is one of the big advantages of investing in the corporation over something like an RRSP, um, where you would, again, you know, with the RRSP, you're not paying the corporate tax rate on the investment income but you are going to pay a higher tax on the income you earn on capital gains. So again, this becomes a balancing act. And I'm not saying that one is better than the other. And in fact, I would recommend both. It's just how you use them. And it's the combination of what type of investments you have in each vehicle to maximize the total financial reward of your uh, of growing your legacy. Um, and you know, those are the big fundamental differences. There is also unregistered investments. Now, unregistered investments, again, are going to be very similar to a corporation, um, uh, in that, uh, you're going to pay at your marginal tax rate on the capital gain. So again, you're only going to pay tax on half. Um, and you're also, um, you know, dividends are going to be subject to the dividend tax rate. Uh, the big advantage here is with dividend income in an unregistered is that you're receiving the dividend personally, so it's not going into a refundable dividend uh, tax on hand account, and then you're waiting till you issue yourself a dividend. You'll just pay the lower tax based on that tax schedule we showed you earlier uh, on the dividend income. Uh, and if it's investments, it's probably mostly going to be eligible dividends. Um, and again, the difference between an eligible and a non-eligible, for those of you who are curious is an eligible dividend is for corporations who have been paid tax at the full general tax rate. Um, and a um, non-eligible dividend is for income that was earned and where the corporation paid tax at the low, sorry, um, small business tax rate. And because you paid less tax, uh, it's non-eligible. It doesn't get as much of a dividend tax credit personally. So you pay more personal tax because the corporation hasn't paid as much tax. And again, going back to that theory of integration where they're trying to make it the same. Um, so if corporations have paid different tax rates, you're going to get a different tax credit personally uh, and pay more on those non-eligible dividends. Um, and I have gone for a while here and spilt a mouthful of information. I do want to open it up for Q&A now. Um, if anyone has any questions about any of this, um, please feel free to post it in the uh, Q&A or even the chat. I've been, um, it's been eerily quiet in the Q&A today, um, so I'm not sure um, if that's something I need to be concerned about, if I've done a terrible job or if I've done an absolutely amazing job uh, and I've been able to answer all your questions. Um, and... Uh, Thank you uh, for those of you who are joining us on the live here. Uh, I do see that there are a few of you. Um, and I love the comments, Suresh. Thank you. Uh, hello to you, sir, as well. Um, for those of you who are watching live, yeah, keep those uh, comments coming. 
they help with engagement and getting this out to more people. So Rob, uh, I'm glad you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your session. I hope you found this, uh, this useful. Uh, and I'll just give it another minute uh, before wrapping up here. It doesn't look like any other questions are coming through. Ah, here we go. We got a few more. Um, would a switch from a director's fees to dividend payments trigger a possible audit from CRA? Also, do some people switch between these payment methods between years or depending on revenue generated? So in my experience, I've never seen someone audited over switching from salary to dividend or dividend to salary. People switch back and forth all the time. Um, so that's not necessarily a, a trigger for an audit. In fact, I've never seen it be so. Um, also, do some people switch between these pay methods between years or depending upon the revenue generated? Absolutely. Um, so there are situations um, where a individual might have built up a lot of money, retained earnings inside their corporation and, you know, take a sabbatical or maybe, you know, there's a gap in contracts. A lot of the banks uh, will insist that you take a, a sabbatical after a two year period. Um, and so where they don't have as much income in the corporation, but they're still pulling out the same amount of money to cover their cost of living, uh, in which case it may not make sense for us to declare a salary because a salary would generate a loss, which we may not be able to carry back. Um, and in that case, we might choose to do a dividend uh, in that year over a salary. But then when they go back to contracting the following year and they're generating income, we may switch back again to a salary strategy. Um, so it's not uncommon for people to switch back and forth. There are also situations where you might do a bit of both, um, some salary, some dividend. Now, my personal belief is um, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. Um, so I don't like mixing dividend and salary strategies because if you're, if you're looking at a dividend strategy, it's like I said, usually because you don't value RSP, you don't value uh, CPP and you want the better cash flow. So why would you mix the two and still pay salary and potentially hit the maximum CPP and not get any benefit really of the um, reduced cash outflow? Um, you might get some small benefits of some timing difference, but there are some other methods that we can use if you, for whatever reason, don't have the cash flow to pay uh, your source deductions. And, and if you're ever in the situation where you're not going to be able to pay your source deductions for whatever reason, make sure you speak to your accountant about it because there are some strategies that we can use. Uh, but it's really important because the penalties on a late source deduction payment or, or late uh, payroll tax contribution or payment is 10%, like if you're a minute late. Um, and it can be 20% in the second year if you're late two years in a row. Um, so you really, really do not want to be late on those source deduction payments. Um, and yeah, thanks again, Rob. I'm glad you found it useful. Um, does the personal insurance is the corporation expense? Um, so let me make sure I understand your question, uh, Vadim. Um, so is, um, uh, for personal insurance, is it a is it a corporation deduction? And generally speaking, no. Um, you can deduct certain insurance in your corporation. Uh, errors and emissions, no problem. Uh, health and dental, no problem. Um, if you're getting life or disability, that's something you should speak to about your accountant beforehand. Um, with life, it's specifically disallowed unless it's you know part of a bank covenant, uh, which is not going to happen on a notice to read or financial statement. Um, but uh, you can still pay for it with retained earnings inside. You can pay for it with corporate tax dollars as opposed to personally tax dollars, which is going to give you the a benefit of that, you know, lower corporate tax rate versus the higher personal tax rate, as opposed to having to take the money out, pay personal tax, and then pay for the life insurance. In addition, benefits to a life insurance policy, again, go to that capital dividend account and flow out to the beneficiary or the shareholders tax-free. So life insurance inside of a corporation can be a, a very effective tool, um, but uh, personal insurance is not deductible inside your corporation. I mean, it's personal insurance. Um, is there a lifetime capital gain exemption? Uh, what amount is it? It's Yes, there is. There's a lifetime capital gains exemption. Again, I would encourage you to come check out our webinar on the top 10 tax strategies 
where we cover that in, more in depth. Um, it's indexed to inflation, so I don't know off the top of my head how much it is right now, but it was like over 887000 last year. Um, and what that means is if you do sell shares of your business, um, that you can um, make that capital gains exempt um, and you get that for every shareholder. Um, in addition, there's ways to um, to multiply that with uh, family trusts. Um, but that only works if you have someone who's actually willing to buy shares in your business. Uh, with most um, service-based professionals, uh, most of our clients, unfortunately, they're really not building a saleable business. Um, it's more of a lifestyle business where if they're not working in the business, there's not much saleable value. Um, so yes, there is a lifetime capital gains exemption, um, making sure that you would qualify by being able to sell shares of your business and that you qualify because, you know, the, cause there are some rules about where the income is generated from. Um, you can't have passive investment income, um, more than a certain amount, um, inside the corporation in order to be eligible. So there are some things to be aware of. Again, go watch our webinar on the top 10 tax advanced tax strategies for corporations, and you'll get more information on the lifetime capital gains exemption uh, or speak with one of your, uh, speak with your account manager and they'll be able to go through that in more detail. Again, Vadim, uh, it sounds like I got your question. So uh, glad to have been of service. And again, thank you everyone uh, for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, it was amazing to me to have over 75 people uh, interested in tax planning, which, you know, my family members tell me is boring. Um, so thank you again uh, for taking time out of your schedules. And we'll be back uh, Friday with a great uh, webinar on Friday AI with Jim Harris talking about Zapier, talking about artificial intelligence. Um, it's a it's going to be a really great session. So if you haven't uh, registered, please do so um, and uh, get signed up for that as soon as possible. Thanks. Everyone. Oh, we got one more. Oh, just a thank you. You're welcome. Um, and have a great day, everyone.